This is a really hardcore subject. I'll try to talk to you like I was in a Hollywood screen presentation, and I'm trying to sell my movie. So if we're going to talk hardcore politics, uh, it's impossible, considering what we're living at the moment with Syria, with Ukraine, with the overall crisis of the capitalist system. And I'll try to be very optimistic, which uh, by definition and by instinct, I'm not. I tend to be a real politic practitioner. I, I try to see facts, uh, how they interact on the ground, and what's really happening, and try to read currents and what's going on around the world. So at the moment, we are, as of course, in, we in Europe know, uh, it's, uh, it's the end of the old order, like Gramsci would say. We don't know how the new order is going to be brought, uh, who is going to bring it, and how it's going to come about. So we are in this historical intersection. But on the other side of the world, which is uh, where I tend to live, uh, I, I, I live on a, on, a, on a shuttle. I live between Europe and Asia. And this is my area. This is my hood when I'm in Asia. And I'm going to be talking to you es essentially about what's going on with the new Silk Roads, the new great game in Eurasia. Who's playing this game? What is their vision? Uh, the vision of a Chinese dream, the vision of Eurasia being integrated, which is completely different from what in Europe we hear all the time, which is the language of uh, NATO uh, antagonizing virtually everybody, or NATO behaving like a robocop all over the world, or the language of sanctions, or the language of our imperial masters all the time. So, let's try to be positive at least once, right? So, uh, I'm going to tell you a story that starts uh, basically 2,000 years ago. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are family with the uh, original Seidenstrasse, whose name, of course, was coined by a German in 1877. But it was not one Seidenstrasse. It was a, a complex of roads, myriad roads, linking the two imperial powers of the time, Imperial China and Imperial Rome. And there is a, a historical character which always fascinated me ever since I started studying uh, the, the Silk Road, Cheng Qian. He was an emissary of King Wu Ti 2,000 years ago. This is the guy who invented the Silk Road because he was sent by in, uh, Emperor King Wu Ti to travel from China all the way to India, explore those territories which were the west of China, and everything west of China uh, at the end of the Great Wall, in fact, at the Jiayu Guan Pass, uh, west and south, southwest and northwest, was considered by China as barbarian lands. But he was not only thinking in terms of uh, uh, exploring these barbarian lands, but interacting with these barbarian lands and bringing what was most important about them, which was not only uh, merchandise or goods, but uh, religion. And in the case of Buddhism, Buddhism is not even a religion. Buddhism is a way of life, in fact. So Chang Chen was the inventor of the Silk Road. And then, of course, uh, we in the West only knew about the Silk Road when uh, Baron Richthofen coined the term Silk Road in 1877. Uh, and he was, uh, it, it's a misnomer, in fact, from the beginning, uh, there are Silk Roads that go through Kashmir, through Afghanistan, through Central Asia, through what is today Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, Balkh, Merv, all these, uh, Bukhara, all these uh, fascinating uh, uh, centers of uh, old civilizations, and they were interacting as well. And it was not only silk, it was, uh, it was an exchange of goods, it was an exchange of culture, an exchange, of course, of religion as well, so Hinduism, especially Buddhism. Uh, there's another fabulous character in the 7th century, the monk uh, Xuanzuang, which was sent by the Tang dynasty to go to India and recover Buddhist manu original Buddhist manuscripts in Sanskrit. And it's fascinating because nowadays, still nowadays, when you go to Siam, uh, the form of, of course, uh, the seat of the former imperial capital was Shanghan at the time. Today's Xi'an. 
And you find uh, Chinese calligraphers that transcript uh, the original manuscripts that uh, Xuan Zhuang brought on horseback or donkey back all the way from India through the Karakoram, uh, Western China, all the way back to Xi'an. And they transcribe the literal translations that Xuan Zhuang made of the original Sanskrit Buddhist sutras. It's something absolutely, it's one of the most beautiful things you can see in your life. I was very uh, privileged because when I went to Xi'an years ago, one of my first trips, I, I, I met one of these calligraphers and he told me this story that he learned obviously from his ancestors for centuries in fact. And uh, I got from him an exact translation of the Heart Sutra from Sanskrit to Mandarin, and it's a perfect rectangle. It's, uh, you cannot even imagine how he did something like this. So this is a, a small illustration of the power of the Silk Road in terms of interchange of cultures. No? Uh, and then, obviously, afterwards, with, uh, when our European explorers, of course, they discovered the maritime Silk Road, but the European version, uh, the original Silk Roads, in fact, oblivion, total oblivion for centuries. And they were rediscovered in the 19th century by another batch of Europeans, but these were, it's, it's a completely different uh, frame of mind, like uh, Aurel Stein, uh, Paul Pelliot, uh, von Lecoq, German, of course, uh, Sven Heding from Sweden, and they discovered some of the uh, treasures of the Old Silk Road in, in terms of goods, in terms of art, in terms of uh, Buddhas with Greek robes, uh, Gandhara art, right? And, uh, and not only that, but also uh, how this disappeared completely from, uh, uh, in fact, this never appeared in the Western frame of mind until the 19th century, until they discovered this for us in the West, right? Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, this all disappeared from the, during the great game at, uh, at the late 19th century, which was basically a British empire against uh, uh, the two uh, great imperial powers of the time, the, Ru uh, the Russians and the Brits. Uh, but this disappeared from the Western frame of mind since the late 19th century until, obviously, fall of the wall in Berlin, fall of the USSR, and what happened? Central Asia goes back to... Uh, you know, people in the West started asking, okay, what's happening in Turkmenistan? What is Uzbekistan? Who lives there? What kind of people are that? And obviously, uh, interest uh, by Westerners on the Chinese part of the Silk Road, starting in Xi'an, going all the way to Xinjiang, Western China. Uh, obviously, people in the West, they were focusing on the Uyghur trouble and the fact that China cannot respect the Uyghur minorities, but there was also the Silk Road element in all this as well. So uh, we rediscovered uh, the Silk Road twice, in the late 19th century, during the Great Game, and we rediscovered the Silk Road in a new, completely different framework, which I, I choose to call the new Great Game in Eurasia, which is what's been going on since uh, the fall of, uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, the integration or reintegration of Central Asia as independent nations, in fact, some of them completely crazy. If you go to Turk, if those of you who have been to Turkmenistan know that it's a country that uh, Tristan Zara or Andre Breton could not have imagined, in fact. It's completely crazy. And they pride themselves to be totally independent. Uh, and it's a gas republic. So it's a crucial country because it could be, uh, in terms of uh, our the way uh, our friends in Brussels see international relations, Turkmenistan, eventually, if you can do business with them, which is something completely complicated as well, could be a replacement for uh, Europe's dependency on Gazprom gas, in fact. But this is something that might happen eventually in the future. So, the new, what is the new great game in Eurasia? In fact, is the resurrection of the Silk Road as the new Silk Roads. And who historically, don't forget, it's 5,000 years of history, they never forget it, they rehash it, they uh, 
reappraise it, uh, they reevaluate it, and they project to the future. So what the Chinese are doing now with their new Silk Road projects, which uh, what you see in this map, which is very imperfect, is basically the high-speed rail connection between China and Europe. So you can read this as a sort of gigantic subway, in fact. You take the subway in Xi'an or Shanghai, and two days later, you're going to show up in Berlin. It's going to take 10 years for this to happen. But the thing is, the Chinese already thought about it. They planned how to do it. They have the money and the political will to do it, and they are already building it, which is something that most people in Europe are not aware of at all. And to see this being worked out and being organized on the spot is absolutely mind-boggling. So what I'm trying to tell you tonight is uh, uh, some of the nodes and some of the you know, organisms that are involved into building the new Silk Roads. Uh, so it's part of the, when, when, I, when I say that uh, the new Silk Roads are part of the new great game, this implies that there is a, let's say, a counterpunch from the other side. The other side is us. The other side is the West. You can read the new Silk Roads and the integration of Eurasia as a plan B by the Chinese, by the Iranians, by the Russians as well. And this is very nuanced. Unfortunately, I won't have enough time to get into details. But as a plan B to Western hegemony. And this is something that our friends in the Pentagon, in that you know, uh, acronym salad of US intel agencies, 16 or 17 of them, they know it very well. And they know that uh, this, uh, what I call the strategic partnership between Russia and China, what they are offering, not only Eurasia, but the rest of the developing world, the global south, in fact, is a project for the future. It's going to take, for the implementation, this thing is going to take at least 10 years so we can see the visible signs, so 2025, right? But they have the political will, they have the, the connections, they are building their connections, and the facts on the ground, we see when we see the intersection of uh, uh, financial plans, uh, development banks, uh, state policies, etc. So who are some of these players? It was fascinating. I don't know how it was reported on the German press a few months ago. Uh, I know how it was reported in China, in Russia, and the US especially. There was a summit in Russia, in Ufa, uh, most, of, most of you probably never heard of, or been to Ufa, right? But what happened in Ufa? It was a, a double summit. The BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and the SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is basically China, Russia, and uh, uh, Central Asian stands. And soon we're going to have India and Pakistan as well. And Iran is, a, is an observer. Soon Iran will be admitted as a member of the group. So it's already a G8, an Asian G8, which soon could become an Asian G9 when Iran comes, probably 2017, after the end of sanctions, if the sanctions end early next year. So the summit of these two organizations, and at the same time, our friend, which Germany, not exactly our friend, Vladimir Putin, he had the brilliant idea of calling an informal meeting of the Eurasian Economic Union, which you all know is something that uh, Putin wants Ukraine to be part of. And it's at the heart, right at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis. So Ukraine would have to decide, are we going to be a member or an associate agreement with the European Union, or are we going to be a member of the Eurasian Economic Union? This is not uh, mutually exclusive, and never was. We know the usual suspects made it mutually exclusive, and it's not. It's possible to have an economic and trade cooperation between the European Union and this, uh, I wouldn't say thriving at the moment, but budding uh, Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, so these three organizations and the members, member countries of these three organizations, they discussed what, essentially? Eurasian integration. And what, what's the meaning of Eurasian integration for these organizations, which include high level decision level, high level decision level, in fact? It's a mix of the new Silk Road, this Chinese new Silk Roads, and the Russian 
driven integration of some countries that were part of the old uh, Soviet Union and new uh, so, uh, post-Soviet republics as well. Basically, what's, what's driving all this? Trade and commerce, integration through uh, good infrastructure, which most of these countries don't have. Like, uh, I'll give an example. Until a few years ago, to travel, if you were trying to cross the border between Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, you would you take a taxi to the border, uh, you had to carry your luggage for two kilometers, then you get to another <laughs> customs point, and then you had to try to find somebody to take you to the next capital. It's completely crazy. And the customs point was basically a shack in the middle of a desert. So you need integration between these countries, and obviously, uh, because oh, we all know the way Stalin divided Central Asia, there are minorities in Turkmenistan, there are minor especially in Uzbekistan, there are minorities that are cl clashing with the overall majority, you name it. But this is feasible if you have trade and commerce uniting all these countries. So we have this summer in uh, this summit in Ufa, everybody discussing new uh, ways of integration based on what? Uh, infrastructure uh, banks, and the Chinese have an answer, which is the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was heavily promoted by China for the past year or so. There are 47, 48 countries that already subscribe to this bank, and this bank is going to finance infrastructure all over Asia, and that inclu includes Central Asia as well. And another new bank, which is the BRICS Development Bank, the NDB, this is something that the BRICS had been discussing for the past four or five years. And finally, now it's working. Uh, for the moment, the capital is not enormous at the beginning. It's $100 billion, but they can get $400 billion in, this, in two or three years. When they get that kind of money, they can finance infrastructure projects, not only in the five BRICS countries. And uh, in our framework, we're talking about basically China, India, and Russia in terms of Eurasia, but they can finance across the wider Eurasian region. And I heard from officials, and I don't doubt them, in fact, because they follow what's going on in the Middle East, they could even finance the reconstruction of Syria, which we all know has been destroyed uh, by, a, a, I would say, a foreign-provoked civil war, in fact. So these were the discussions. And at the same time, there was something absolutely extraordinary. I, I was very privileged to be there. Uh, the Vienna P5 plus one and Iran deal. So uh, while we were in Vienna waiting for the deal, and it was absolutely fascinating because you, you, you were talking to people who were at the table. And I was talking especially with the Iranians. And they were telling me, this, this is really hardcore, big power politics, the way it's decided, you know, that from one day to another, one of the parties, which was usually the U.S., because the Europeans were, I'm sorry to tell you guys, uh, they were spectators in the whole thing. The real deciders were the U.S. and Iran, and a third, you know, in third place, a uh, long shot, the Russians. These were the people who were actually deciding how to frame the what, almost 90 pages of the Iran P5 plus uh, one nuclear deal. And this was something that uh, everybody that followed this dossier for the past few years knew it was a manufactured story. Iran, you know, at least for the past 10 years, from the beginning of the 2000s, in fact, they never wanted to get a nuclear weapon. Uh, there were fatwas by Khomeini, fatwas by Ayatollah Khamenei that, we, uh, you know, a nuclear weapon is anti-Islamic. And this guy simply cannot lie. He is the religious political leader of 80 million Shiites in Iran. These people don't lie. Only people in the Pentagon and the CIA think that you can lie and get away with it with something so serious. So it was a manufacturer crisis. And they have a very weak hand uh, going... Don't forget that this, this was Iran negotiating with six of the big powers in the world. You can say that Russia and China were more or less on their side, which they were. But still you have the U.S. and the Europeans. And uh, Germany's position was very sound, by the way, compared to the, the, the French and the Brits. But in the end, they got what they wanted. They got moral... If, uh, if major if, uh, the deal is holds, 
and the sanctions are erased uh, in early 2016. And, of course, uh, uh, the Americans follow their promises. We never know. Just look at the historical record, right? Then we're going to have Iran reintegrated with the West. Not that Iran was excluded from international community. Unless you describe international community as the European Union, NATO, uh, basically NATO. No, the international community is not NATO. There's the global south. There's the non-aligned movement, over 100 countries. So, you know, the world is very, very big. And it's much bigger than NATO. And Iran was still doing business with Asia, especially. So now Iran is being courted once again. We all know the German, French, British delegations going to Tehran virtually on a weekly basis. They are desperate to do business with Iran. Not only because of all the oil and gas that they have, but the fact that they are a virgin 80 million well-educated market for Western capitalism. So it's a big, big deal to go to Iran. And of course, if we talk to our friends in Brussels, the European Union who's trying to forge uh, uh, a new uh, energy policy, as far as I remember, since 2002, and I talked to a lot of people in the European Commission, they are always complaining, oh, the Russians, it's difficult to negotiate with the Russians. Okay, but what, are you, what do you have to propose? Why don't you go to Turkmenistan? Why don't you go to Iran and propose something to them? Ah, we can't because the Americans won't let us. Now it's different. Now the Americans will let them. And the Americans, there's nothing the Americans can do in terms of business with Iran. Iran has two options now. They will do business with the EU, obviously, including the EU oil and gas majors, energy majors, and they will keep doing what they were doing, business with Asia. They, you know, they have clients in China, in South Korea, in Japan, so, and they are in the best possible position. On top of it, they happen to be at the crucial central node of the new Silk Roads. Iran, don't forget, it's the Caspian Sea in the north, the Persian Gulf on the south, huge oil and gas reserves, huge market. They trade already with everybody from Southwest Asia to South Asia to Central Asia and with China. And they happen to be, in terms of China, a matter of national security because they are among the top three uh, suppliers of oil and gas to China. So this alliance, you can say an alliance of convenience, of course, between uh, uh, Iran and China, for Beijing is extremely important. So Beijing doesn't see Iran now thinking, ah, we're going to be allied with the West from now on. It's not going to happen. You just need to go to Iran and talk to the leadership, and they'll say, no, we still think they are the great Satan. Obviously, there are nuances to that. But we want to do business with Europe. Europe wants to do business with us. But we'll keep doing business with Eurasia, especially. And this means what? India, China, and Russia, especially. Russia, obviously, because they're the, the, the weapons, uh, uh, interlocking weapons uh, systems uh, as well, and selling, uh, Russian selling weapons to, to Iran. So it was fantastic because just what? Four, three months ago. We had this summit in Ufa, we had the, the deal in Vienna, and this was sort of a blueprint of the roadmap of how Eurasian integration is going to go on uh, from now on. And it's a, what is even more in, impressive, in fact, is that this was called by the Chinese a while ago. I would say a long time ago. The Chinese, all, you know that they think in terms of five-year plans. Already in 1999, they had an official policy called, uh, translating into, into English, Go West. Their Go West started delocalizing from uh, the eastern seaboard, which was already developing very fast, to the central provinces and to Xinjiang as well, the far west. So, you know, uh, enterprises, corporations, uh, individuals, uh, companies, go west and we're going to help you. Settle down over there. Let's develop what until, for, for Imperial China, was always barbarian lands, you know, beyond the Great Wall. And over the years, they start, the think tanks in, uh, in, in Beijing, especially, Chinese Academy of uh, Social Sciences, etc., they start developing papers. Okay, let's expand, go west, to the west as well. But we have to cross what's in between. What's in between is what? Central Asia. 
So go west in terms of exporting uh, uh, industrial overcapacity of China, in fact, to Central Asia, across Central Asia, to Iran, making a connection with Iran, Iran is a central hub, to Turkey as well, and from Turkey would be, you know, it's on, on the borders of uh, Western Europe. So uh, it was not Xi Jinping that came up with the concept of new silk roads. This was being organized and sought carefully by the Chinese for years. And even during Hu Jintao, the previous uh, Chinese leader, they already had all the papers and all the planning. Okay, they still didn't know how to call it, but it was basically their let's go west policy which Xi Jinping, uh, who has, I would say, a Hollywood knack for good PR, and uh, he's very, very clever. Just, just look at how he handled his uh, latest trip to the US. He called it uh, uh, one road, one belt, which doesn't translate very well, in fact. That's a problem with Chinese, always lost in translation. But it works very well for the Chinese. Everybody now knows in China what is one road, one belt, because they are selling this as China expanding and reaching out to the rest of the world. And at the same time, this is part of the Chinese dream. If you, if you take the metro in Beijing, you see uh, outdoors everywhere, Chinese dream. And what is behind the Chinese dream? There's a, a picture of a high-speed rail train. It's fascinating. So they imprint in the mind of Chinese citizens that the Chinese dream is, okay, you're going to become a middle-income country soon, which is the promise of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party for the next decade, in fact, which is a pretty tall order, but uh, they have to fulfill it. And at the same time, China will be expanding all over the world. So uh, this also means that the new Chinese middle class, which depending on how you measure it, could be 200 million, 300 million, or even 500 million, which is <laughs> larger than the population of the EU, they will be reaching out to the rest of the world as well. You know, coming, uh, you go to the Galerie Lafayette, and everybody speaks Mandarin, of course, because who are the, <laughs> who are the major clients? The Chinese. <laughs> So this happened in this past few months, in fact, this past three or four months. The problem is there is a counter project against this. The Chinese, they're selling this dream, which is an internal dream of becoming a middle class country by the next decade. And uh, let's say upper middle class nation, essentially, if you discount 300 million peasants which would always be excluded from the rest of China by 2040, which happens to be, by the way, what Deng Xiaoping, once again, one of the great statesmen of the 20th century. These are the letters of the law according to Deng Xiaoping. We're not going to have a Western uh, parliamentary democracy. We're going to be, uh, by the 2020s, we're going to be a middle-income country, which means a GDP of $10,000 a year. It's not very big compared to Western Europe, but for China, it's beyond imagining. And by 2040, we're going to be an established middle-class country, and we could even have some democratic ideas being implemented. Democracy, don't forget that democracy, the Chinese way, is democracy uh, applied to you know, communities, uh, municipal elections, etc. doesn't mean that we're going to have an alternance of power at the top, unless, of course, there is another Chinese revolution. And this is the absolute imponderable. We don't know. But if they keep selling this dream of uh, internal cohesion, Chinese dream, and expansion of China to the rest of the world, and China would be respected all over the world and treated as a major partner in international relations, which for them, this is very, extremely important. It's a, it's a matter of an Asian thing of not losing face. We have to be respected for our 5,000 years of history, in fact. Then they will accomplish what they view, and, uh, and this is, uh, uh, I, I, I'm trying to, you know, the essence of uh, the thinkers behind the leadership in Beijing. What do they really want? They want China to be on a parity level with the U.S., in fact. Uh, there was a lot of talk a few, two, uh, three years ago about the G2, 
Beijing, Washington. In fact, this is what they really want. They know that they, there's, there's no G1 with China as leader of the world because there's a matter of soft power. And Chinese soft power doesn't travel like American soft power does. So uh, even if they had uh, 10 Hollywoods uh, you know, in Mandarin, in English, bilingual, it wouldn't work. Uh, even if they could uh, you know, uh, do uh, replicas of Mad Men, of Breaking Bad, it still wouldn't work. So it's lost in translation. But they want to be respected as stakeholders of a new international order. And this is where their dream interacts with what the BRICS want, what Brazil wants, what India wants, what China, with what Russia wants. And the way this thing is being uh, forged together now is the intersection between the new Silk Road, which is this enormous subway through Central Asia, and there's, of course, the, the Maritime Silk Road, which is a network of ports, which, and of course, uh, it works both ways. Europe exporting to Asia and Asia exporting to Europe through this network. And everybody in between is integrated. So you have uh, Pakistan integrated, Iran as well, uh, Eastern Africa, etc. And in Central Asia, especially Central Asia, uh, Iran and Turkey. So if we have this until 2025, it's a, it's a radical change in terms of international relations because everything is based in trade and commerce. It's not based on antagonism, it's not based on militarism, it's not based on unbridled... Uh, okay, there's going to be uh, uh, instances of unbridled neoliberalism involved in all this, but it's not... Everything is not going to be controlled by financial capitalism. It's going to be moved essentially by trade. And this is something that the Chinese learned when they joined the WTO. Uh, they, they, okay, how are we going to be uh, on a parity level with the superpower? It's very simple. We are an exporting nation. Our model is exporting. Uh, it has worked for 30 years. Now it's different. Now they're stabilizing. If you, if you, you cannot grow for 10, uh, 12 percent a year every year. If you grow at 7, which is already absurd in terms of, of the West, it's still very good. And in 15 years, they can quadruple their economy. This is something unheard of in the West. So we, you cannot even imagine how uh, integrated and powerful China is going to be by the middle of the next decade, in fact. When Theoretically, all this is going to be built. Uh, they have the political will to do it because this was this. Okay, it's top down, but you have to. It's like a Plato's Republic with Chinese characteristics. It's uh, on the top, they decide, and everybody has to. If you don't follow it, you go to jail, or they, you know, Allah ISIS, they cut your head off. Uh, and something that the Americans were. They never saw it coming, which is, uh, this, this is the most fascinating thing. Uh, so th the discussion in Washington that's been going on for the past year or so, who lost Russia? You did, idiots. So, you know, the Russia-China strategic partnership was not in the cards from the beginning. Uh, I'm sure many of you remember Putin in Munich years ago. He was proposing what? an integration of Russia to the European Union. He was talking about, uh, you know, a single family from Lisbon to Vladivostok. What did the EU do about this? Nothing. They ignore or spurn Putin. And this is very important. This is extremely important to understand what's going on nowadays in Syria, Ukraine, etc. The Russians said, okay, we are being uh, uh, snubbed by the EU, we are being antagonized by the Americans, we are being treated like shit by the Americans, in fact. What are you going to do? So they were biding their time. And now, after the, the Ukraine tragedy, that's the only way of putting it, because it was, a, a, I would say, an agglomeration of misunderstandings by the Americans, by the Russians, by the Ukrainians, and by... I would say, I will put the Germans into it as well. The Germans thought that they could have an Ukrainian uh, colony with uh, the boxer Klitschko as a leader, which is completely ridiculous when you, when you think about it. So it was an agglomeration of misunderstandings from all players. 
the Russians said, okay, what is our plan B? The plan, they already knew the plan B, what it was, because this was being discussed at those BRIC summits. The BRIC summits is fascinating because I remember years ago, they were just saying, okay, we're going to get together. What are we going to do? Okay, ah, maybe we can do a bank. Oh, maybe we can uh, you know, sell our stuff to each other in our own currencies. Ah, but it's too complicated. Uh, th this is in euros. This is in dollars. And suddenly, from the BRICS summit last year to the BRICS summit this year in Russia, they got their act together. They have their bank going. Um, of course, the, their internal crisis, their enormous internal crisis. There is an internal crisis in Russia because they need to get rid of the sanctions. There is an absolutely horrendous internal crisis in Brazil due to a number of reasons. I'll have to spend the whole day trying to explain that to you. And obviously India. India is ungovernable. Everybody, if you've been there, you know it's totally ungovernable. But the overall foreign policy of the bloc, the BRICS as a bloc, is already established. And they know the way. Okay, we want a multilateral world. We want a multidisciplinary world. We want uh, different centers of decision. For this, we need to, if not emulate, at least try to transcend Western institutions. So we need our own way, ways of financing our infrastructure projects. We need our own banks. Uh, we need to build this new multilateral order that we're talking about all the time, but we, we need the instruments for that. So this is where this integration of the new Silk Road, Chinese-driven, and the Eurasian Economic Union, Russian-driven, intersect. So you can imagine uh, the reaction of our friends in the Pentagon, the CIA, the NSA, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the alphabet soup of uh, US Intel, which is not even able to pinpoint a convoy of white Toyotas crossing from Syria to Iraq, you know, 500 gleaming Toyotas crossing a desert. And U.S. intelligence, they never saw it coming. How can you believe that? Okay. But they knew what was going on between Russia and China. So their counter coup is, look, I, I ha I, I'm going to have to quote from some people. Because uh, just, j just to show how, how the counter coup is going to work. So w on one side, you have this Eurasian proposition of uniting Eurasia through trade and commerce which is something that brings us back 2,000 years ago and at the same time projects us to the future because it involves fiber optics, involves pipelines, involves ports connected to each other, involves high-speed rail, involves this giant subway from Xi'an to Berlin. What does the U.S. has to propose? So I'm going to quote from some guys over here. They are absolutely outstanding. You probably, you probably know some about this. Uh, the Dr. Strange Love, that is the NATO Supreme Commander, uh, Philip Breedlove. He, the, everything that I'm going to quote you is on the record, by the way. He insists that the West must create a rapid reaction force to counteract Russia's false narratives. So this is part of the information. Not only he wants NATO to get uh, into a war on European soil, he wants to get in, and they are already right in the middle of an information war, which we are witnessing at the moment with Syria. Uh, the Pentagon chief, Ash Carter, which is a non-neocon, everybody in Washington knows he's a non-neocon, he's always been a neocon. Uh, you know, he's part of neocon cells inside the Pentagon, which drive policy that's very, very serious because these people, uh, it's not that they are just talking uh, to CNN. They are actually writing and driving policy. He's considering unilaterally, very important, redeploying nuclear-capable missiles in Europe, right here. So we're going to have, maybe in Rammstein, you're going to have nuclear-based missiles soon. The nominee to have the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He's labeled, he, he already labeled, this was a few weeks ago. Russia is America's existential threat, I'm quoting. And the Air Force General, which is nominated to be the new Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. That's the number two guy in the Pentagon. Uh, he, he agrees, not only he agrees, but guess who are the three main threats to the US 
Is this uh, the, cal the fake caliphate in Iraq? Uh, is this is Ildash? No. Russia, China, and Iran. And it's fantastic because they give away, when they say this uh, absolutely stupid thing, they give the game away because we know, uh, we don't even have to research or talk to them to, to see how they're thinking. They identify the three key countries that are trying to organize the Eurasian integration as existential threats to America. What does that mean? That the unipolar world that the US controls is being threatened by the integration of Eurasia. And I have five minutes, and I wish I had 500, but I can't. OK. Latest national military strategy of the United States. The Pentagon says that the caliphate in Syria and Iraq, and we are seeing this this week right in front of our eyes, it's not a big deal. They identify foreign nations as threat. This is very important. This is the national military strategy of the United States. This means this is what the Pentagon is going to do from, has been doing, in fact, and from all, now on to the, all over the, our immediate future. Guess who are the four major threats? Apart from North Korea, which is a case in itself, and we don't have time to get into it, Russia, China, Iran, all over again. So they are depicted as revisionist states. I'm quoting once again. And they uh, defy what the Pentagon identifies, I'm quoting once again, international security and stability, which means the finance, uh, financial capitalism casino that we are all living in and many of us cannot escape from. So uh, if we measure this to 2010, it gets even more uh, worrying, I would say. In 2010, the official Pentagon policy for uh, NATO, and for the Pentagon and for NATO as well, for, for Europe essentially, the biggest threat was terror, terror, terror in China. Now it's Russia and China. So the American industrial military complex, they are trying to pick up a fight with Russia and China at the same time and try to sell this to global public opinion that this is the way to go, which is absolute madness. It's, uh, I would say in terms of madness, it rivals, re you remember uh, mutually assured destruction during the Cold War, mad. This is much worse than mad. This is total madness, in fact. And when we compare to what most people around the world think, who's the greatest threat against the world? There are, no, um, there are not many polls about that. The latest poll we have is late 2003. It was a global Gallup poll, 65 countries. It, was a, they, it took months for, for, you know, to organize, compile the data, et cetera, et cetera. And guess who's uh, the number one threat to the rest of the world? was voted by citizens of 65 countries, the US. So at the moment, we don't know what's going to happen next in terms that uh, the scenarios are, uh, most of them are absolutely horrible. Uh, we don't know if the Pentagon will decide to contain China and Russia at the same time instead of uh, the caliphate in uh, Syria and Iraq, which is what they have been doing so far, by the way. And that's why Russia went into Syria because the coalition of the dodgy opportunists led by the US with Saudi Arabia and Turkey, come on, this is a joke, fighting against people that they are supporting would never work. So that's why the, uh, the Russians are there, because they know that the next step, if they conquer Aleppo, they go to Grozny. Aleppo to Grozny is 900 kilometers. For the Russians, this is an absolute nightmare. And that's why for Russia, it's important to contain the caliphate in Syria. And it's not for the US, because the US is too far away. It's on the other side of the ocean. So uh, it, it, it's very hard with the time that I have to finish on a non-nihilist note. But uh, <laughs> so uh, what I can say is that whatever strategy that the industrial, military, financial, media complex in the US has, uh, what we can call the, mas the true masters of the universe, not the paper boys like Obama carry these people. These people, the people who really run the business, they are invisible and they were in the Washington Wall Street axis. These are the people who run the system. We still don't know what they really want. Uh, I have echoes from some people who are close to them that they are terrified of this 
simultaneous antagonism of Russia and China at the same time. They would love to be part of this integration of Eurasia in terms of American business opportunity. Don't forget, America is a business country and they are being excluded because of themselves from this. So they want to be part of it. So if they opt for antagonism, they're going to exclude themselves from the game. Uh, at the same time, the Russians and the Chinese, uh, uh, I would say in, con in conceptual terms, long term, uh, they are almost Buddhist because they know this is inevitable, political will is there, uh, the, the mechanisms of infrastructure and integration are there. So uh, we c if we need to finish on an optimistic note, I would say, okay, 2025, 10 years from now, uh, and we can think about... Uh, 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 a descendant of uh, Chen Cheng, the guy who invented the Silk Road. He takes the subway in Xi'an and he lands in uh, Berlin at the Haus der Kulturen der Welt two days later and he's very happy and he'll be interacting with Germany, the most powerful country in Europe, and the world is going to be, you know, a Hollywood happy ending. So I would say that this would be the greatest way for this new great game to finish, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>